حبيب الله رسول الله حبيب الله الله our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him he wanted humans to be the best and give his best religion to them Allah our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على نبيه ومصطفى سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه وبعد Dear viewers, welcome to a new edition of Gardens of the Pious Our phone numbers beginning with the air code are 002238 triple five two four eight or two four nine and the email address is gardens at huda dot tv inshallah today we will begin with the last hadith in the book of truthfulness al-sadq kitab al-sadq of riyadu salihin by al-imam al-nawawi may Allah have mercy on him this hadith is the 59th hadith then soon after that, insha'Allah, we'll begin the following chapter, which is known as the book of Al-Muraqaba, or the supervision. And in this book, we will study some ayat and some ahadith as well. The book of Al-Muraqaba, or watchfulness, supervision, or the awareness of Allah's uh, presence. So the last hadith, of the book of As-Sadq which is the fourth book في كتاب رياض الصالحين The hadith is narrated by the great companion Hakim ibn Hizam May Allah be pleased with him and his kunya is Abu Khalid عن أبي خالد حكيم ibn Hizam رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم البيعان بالخيار ما لم يتفرقا فإن صدق وبينا بورك لهما في بيعهما وإن كتما وكذبا محقت بركة بيعهما متفق عليه رواه الإمامان البخاري ومسلم حكيم ابن حزام may Allah be pleased with him narrated that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said Al-Bayyani, the two parties, the two parties uh, who are doing a transaction, yani the seller and the buyer, have the right to keep or return goods as long as they have not parted, as long as they are still in the same spot. And if both parties spoke the truth and described the defects and qualities of the goods, then they would be blessed in their transaction. And if they told lies or hit something, then the blessings of their transaction will be eliminated. Obviously, the hadith has a reference with regards to the book of As-Sadq, which is this segment, فَإِنْ صَدَقَ وَبَيَّنَا If they spoke the truth, and they explain the defects as well as the qualities, then their, tra their transaction will be blessed. This hadith is agreed upon its authenticity. It is collected by both al-Bukhari wa Muslim. Uh, trustworthiness and honesty in Islam are of the most important traits and qualities. And basically, we may refer to good manners as trustworthiness. Well, al-amana. Because if the person is Ameen, then he is Sadiq, then he fulfills the promise, then he is truthful. Uh, so basically, this manner is very comprehensive. If the person is described, if the person is labeled with al amana then he is well-mannered. As in the hadith in which the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إذا جاءكم من ترضون دينه وأمانته 
فزوجوا in this hadith the Nabi صلى الله عليه وسلم is telling us whom should we accept his proposal if he were to propose to my daughter or my sister and so on he said a man with a religious commitment and a man who is amin trustworthy because if it is so then he's well mannered and the Nabi صلى الله عليه وسلم who were the best in manners ever whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala perfected his adab he said that my Lord adabani Rabbi fa'ahsana ta'adibi he is the one who educated me and gave me the proper etiquette and taught me to be so and he perfected such adab and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam even before the prophethood was very famous among the Meccans with Al-Amana Al-Sidq and Al-Amana truthfulness and trustworthiness to the extent that this nickname has become much more prominent than his own name the proper noun Muhammad so they say Jaa Al-Sadiq or Al-Amin the truthful the trustworthy has come he has left he has said, he has done because of being very famous of his amana. He has become a source of attraction. Every person wanted to save something in a secure place, he would leave it with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because he was as sadiq al amin To the extent this kind of treatment, how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam treated people with amana continued after the prophethood that is expected but what's so amazing is that his opponents his enemies who once accused him of being a liar after the prophethood of course and who once accused him of being insane or a soothsayer they would not find any better one to trust him with their valuables but Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and this is why we say actions speak louder than words الصادق الأمين صلى الله عليه وسلم. and there are many stories with regards to his amana even before the prophethood because Allah سبحانه وتعالى raised him in such way and he fashioned him to be like that. and that what was really very impressive to Khadija رضي الله عنها when she employed him to lead a caravan of her to Ashan. then she appointed an eye. To keep an eye on Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, so he returned back with the news, the confirmation. This man, I have not seen anyone who is much more honest nor trustworthy than him. And for the first time in their history, a woman who is very prestigious, very wealthy, one of the most powerful women in the society, very very unique, she proposes to him that she wants to marry him. While many Meccan chiefs have proposed to her. And she turned their offers down. Why? Because she knew that they were all after her money, after her wealth. But she is the one who proposed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So al-amana. Al-amana entails many beautiful traits and many beautiful uh, akhlaq. And if the person is uh, labeled with such trait, then he is successful. And as a matter of fact, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam predicted and prophesied that by the end of time as a sign of the nearness of the day of judgment that al-kha'in will be entrusted al-kha'in the treacher and the betrayal the one who does not keep the trust will be entrusted while the trustworthy one would not be entrusted because things will be turned upside down and flipped over وَيُصَدَّقُ فِيهَا الْكَاذِبِ وَيُكَذَّبُ فِيهَا الصَّادِقِ During those days, the liar will be treated as trustworthy. And this is very obvious. When you sit before this small screen and you listen to a bunch of liars, they like a, a lying machine, making and fabricating lies and forging news all the time. And there will be people sitting and listening attentively to them, believe in them. Not only that, 
furthermore propagating their false statements. This is a very serious uh, sign. The companions of the Prophet وسلم, have become likewise umana plural of Amin. Uh, and similarly, at Tabi'een and many of the followers of the Prophet Sallallahu It is a very rare quality, but every Muslim is required to be Ameen, Sadiq and Ameen, truthful and trustworthy. In this hadith, the Nabi Sallallahu said, the two parties of any transaction, he named them al bayan from al bayah and al bayah is the bargain or the trade Basically, it is selling from the root word bay'ah. Bay'ah is to sell, whilst buying is a shara. So he expressed about the two parties by using the term which refers to one of them, since it is commonly used like that. Normally, when we say al-umaran, al-umaran means the two umars. Right away, historians and the seekers of knowledge will realize that we're referring to Umar ibn al-Khattab and Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiyallahu anh. Even though Abu Bakr's name was not Umar, but it has been commonly used. Al-Umaran refers to the two intimate companions, Abu Bakr and Umar. Whenever we say Al-Qamaran, the two moons, it refers to the moon and the sun. The moon is something entirely different than the sun, right? In its nature, in its job, in its size, but whenever we say, as it is commonly used, that they both provide us with light. The moon reflects the light of the sun at night, and the sun is the main source of light and warmth. So similarly, when we say al bayan it refers to the seller and the buyer. For any equation to be balanced, both parties have to fulfill the roles and their duties. Not only look for the rights. So al bayan the seller and the buyer. bil khiyari which means they have the option of what? Of either completing the transaction, of getting a full refund and voiding and nullifying the transaction until they part. So this option is limited to a time or a place. Basically, it is limited to the place, even if the time is prolonged. When you sit in a jewelry shop and you make a purchase and everything and you've got the receipt and you already made the payment, transaction is complete. So long as you're sitting in the shop and you have not moved and you did not part away from the seller, you have all the right to return the goods and get a full refund even without the consent of the, buyer, of the seller. It's not his uh, choice. Why? Because the transaction is not completed yet. We are still in the same sitting, in the same spot. Whether the time is a few minutes, or even if it is prolonged, this is something that the Sharia has mandated. It gives each party of the transaction the right to think and double think about it. Nowadays, there are multiple options. For instance, the seller may give you a a refund policy of one month, couple months. In some stores in North America, they give you six months. And they say satisfaction guaranteed. If you're not satisfied, simply you can return the goods and get a full refund. Even if you did not find any defect or any false in the merchandise. When the seller does so, that's an option that he took upon himself and he offered the buyer, and the buyer may use this right, but with wisdom and justice. What does it mean? It means you should not take advantage of the situation. It means that some people just go and pick up items or whatever. They buy with the intention of using for a while, then refunding them back, returning them and getting a full refund. That is not permissible. Because such person is not trustworthy, is not a mean. He's concealing a hidden intention, which is not good. For instance, if the seller knows that this person is going to buy the, the washer or the dryer or the refrigerator or the bike and use it for six months, 
or the vacuum cleaner for six months. Then simply a few days before the period elapsed, he would bring it back to the store and say, uh, I would like to return it. Okay, was there anything wrong with it? No, I'm not satisfied. You're not satisfied? Okay. So they give you the refund. It's a policy, but somebody is taking advantage of the situation and this is haram. There is a difference between somebody who really bought it because he needed it, but he figured out there is another item somewhere else which is in a better price or in a better condition, better manufacturer, etc. So you're really utilizing your right. But taking advantage of the situation contradicts the concept of the amana or trustworthiness. Okay. So as long as they are in the same sitting, both have the right to cancel the whole transaction. The seller as well as the buyer. And whenever any of the two parties decide so, it is not contingent on the consent of the other party because both maintain the right. Once they part, they separate, and he steps out of the shop or he does his business, that's it. Unless if they both mandated the extra condition, which is, give me three days, khiyaru, a short. So I put a condition, three days, a week, 15 days, money back guarantee, whatever, whether from the seller part or from both parties. So in this condition, they both maintain the right or one of them maintains the right based on the condition. And the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith, al-Muslimuna ala shurutihim or inda shurutihim, which means Muslims must bound to their or are bound to their conditions or commitments I put a condition on myself, I said, if there is anything wrong with it, within 15 days, just bring it back. Money back guaranteed. So I must stick to my statement. I must fulfill the condition. Now we come to the practice in many Muslim societies. Once you purchase the item and you step out of the shop and it falls apart or it breaks because it's a very bad quality, you take it back and say, sorry, we're not taking it back. But it says money back guarantee and it says 15 days, say, yeah, but it's your fault, it's not our fault. Then you enter into the gimmicks area. Such transaction is haram. And who is actually involved in the haram? The party who betrayed. The party who betrayed. That's why Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, فَإِن صَدَقَ وَبَيَّنَا بُورِكَ لَهُمَا فِي بَيْعِهِمَا Wait a minute. The whole world must know about this reality. Whenever we're dealing, even in business transaction, you're not just dealing with the other party, you're dealing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if this is the case, in the next chapter, you will find out that Allah is fully aware of what we do. So you have to be very careful. فَإِن صَدَقَ وَبَيَّنَا بُورِكَ لَهُمَا فِي بَيْعِهِمَا And the Prophet ﷺ used the dual term. Both. If they both are honest. وَبَيَّنَا They declare. And they disclose any defects. Uh, and also the qualities. Normally, the seller will keep talking about the qualities forever and even exaggerate in the qualities. And furthermore speaks about how expensive did he buy it. It was very expensive and I'm just selling it because I need the cash and so on. If he's lying in any of that, then his earning will be deprived from the blessings. And the barakah will be withdrawn and eliminated from his risk. And what does this entail? It entails that it doesn't matter how much profit you make, you will not get to benefit or prosper out of it. You take the money which you think that I fooled a lot of customers today. I tricked an old lady today. I fooled many people today. Okay, how much money did you make? 10 grands today. Only today 10 grands. You go home and your wife is sick. You rush her to the hospital. The bill is 5 grands. Your son is whatever, in a car accident. You hit the car, even you hit it in the garage. I mean that if your risk is void from the barakah, it will be devoured. Sickness, accidents, disease, fire that will catch the, the, the store and burn your merchandise, 
uh, you will eat and you would not feel happy, you would not feel full. Why? Because barakah or the blessings is eliminated from your risk. You did so. You choose to do so. Let me give you an example. Um, normally this happens in buying and selling used cars. In the used cars business, there is a big time deception. When the person is purchasing a car which is used, very rarely you find the seller discloses all the defects, the errors, and the drawbacks in the car. The transmission is functioning properly, but maybe it uh, disconnects, it hangs up at some time or at a certain speed, or perhaps the battery is old and needs to be changed, the tires are worn out and you just bad use tires just to sell it. There are many things that can really ruin this business. But when the seller is amin, so he's sadiq and he explains to the, the buyer, well, I bought this vehicle on that year, it's that year's model, and if it is flooded, you say it is flooded, because nobody knows whether the car is flooded or not if it is painted or whatever, the, the, the body shops can do a lot of, uh, uh, can do a very good job that not even a professional can detect it. So in this case, this is khiyana. But if the person says, well, my car has one, two, three, four defects. Otherwise, it runs fine. Alhamdulillah. And I'm selling it for that much. I've dealt with many Americans like that when you buy a used car, they tell you, they actually post it in the ad. Nothing wrong with that. The believers are more worthy to be like that for the following reasons. Number one, in order to bless the risk. Number two, because you would not get as far as the risk other than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preordained for you. So you have to trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number three, because Allah is fully aware of what you do, other sayings or actions or intentions. So you may fool somebody, you may deceive somebody, you may buy a vacuum and you're not really buying it for good, rather, or to, to, to check it out or to test it, you're buying it to use it for a couple months, then upon leaving you return it and get a full refund. That's not right. فَإِن صَدَقَ وَبَيَّنَا بُورِكَ لَهُمَا فِي بَيْعِهِمَا You said that the Prophet ﷺ addressed the dual, al-ba'i' wal-mushtari, the seller and the buyer. What about the buyer? What does he have to explain? I mean, <laughs> he doesn't need anything about the goods. Well, he may know. He may know what? Let me give you this example to see how beautiful is our religion and the message of the Prophet ﷺ. The companions and at tabi'een and our great scholars said the, the greatest role model and example following the Prophet ﷺ, Ahsanu Uswa, and Imam Abu Hanifa, may Allah have mercy on him. He's an example whom I like to give all the time because he was a successful merchant. He used to sell silk and other good and expensive fabrics. And he was also a successful faqih. So in the market, a woman brought him a thawb, some fabric, and said, I want to sell this. He said, how much would you like to sell it for? She said, a hundred dirham. He said, no way. It worth more than that. She said, are you kidding me? He said, yes, of course. She said, oh, okay, take it for 200. He said, it's still worth more than that. The woman thought he's making fun of her until he increased the price to 500. Just think about it. Believe it or not, a shop owner and somebody's taking his used watch or his suit or whatever or used car and he's going to the shop. Normally, the seller is trying to press uh, the buyer is trying, if, if it is a shop, uh, like the loan shops, for instance, is trying to press the seller, squeeze him to get the best that he can out of him or her. But here the buyer, Abu Hanifa, may Allah have mercy on him. He said, no, it is worth more than that. And he kept adding up to the price five times more until he bought it from her for 500 while she was offering him to buy it for 100. And Imam Hanifa knows that he's actually dealing with Allah. And Allah said about himself, Inna Allah huwa al-razzaqu dhul al-mateen. So if the keys of provision 
are controlled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So why should I deal with other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Why shouldn't I be honest and trustworthy? Because Allah is ever watchful. This is a message that the Prophet sallallahu delivered in this hadith. وَإِن كَتَمَا وَكَذَبَ مُحِقَتْ بَرَكَتُ بَيْعِهِمَا But if they lied, and if they concealed any facts about the goods, about the money, about the, the subject of transaction, then the barakah will be eliminated. The blessing will be erased from such transaction. What a loss. So we need to learn that. As-sidqu man Al-amanah is the most important quality of the believer. This amana, which is earned through being aware of Allah's presence throughout all times and all places, should reflect on your dealing with others, particularly in business. Umar ibn al-Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, overheard somebody who is recommending uh, one person to another. So he asked him, out of curiosity, do you know that the person, do you know the person whom you're recommending he keep, uh, he keep talking about his righteousness, his greatness, and he's such a good person. How do you know him? Is he your neighbor? He said, no. He said, did you travel with him? He said, no. He said, did you do business with him? He said, not that even. He said, perhaps you've seen him going to the masjid frequently. He said, exactly. That's right. He said, that is not enough. In order to judge the reliability of a person, the honesty and trustworthy of a person, you have either to deal with him in business or to travel with him because you get so close to him. You deal with him in eating, drinking, traveling, or he is your neighbor, where if he, if he manages to hide or conceal some bad qualities, he cannot hide forever. But if the person is already sadiq or amin, then he will be sadiq and amin inside and outside. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all from amongst them and bless us with these beautiful traits and qualities. We'll take a short break and we'll be back inshallah in a couple of minutes. Please stay the road to Medina, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and his companions faced lots of troubles and difficulties and enmities and obstacles in the way to Medina before the Hijrah to Medina from Mecca. Uh, also, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has assisted his beloved Prophet and supported him in order to complete his mission and to, uh, uh, to immigrate to Medina. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala uh, has granted us this great Prophet and his companions. Now the question, why the immigration to Medina, the Hijrah of Rasulullah and his companions, was a turning point in the history of uh, Hijrah and the history of Islam? My dear brothers and sisters, what are the sacrifices that the Prophet Muhammad has faced with his companions? Some of these difficulties, inshallah, we will learn together and we will focus in some lessons. What are the lessons that we take from these incidents, inshallah, in our program, uh, Road to Medina? My dear brothers, stay tuned with us, inshallah, in this great uh, uh, event of Hijrah. We will, inshallah, focus on some of the lessons uh, of in this program, Road to Medina. May Allah make it easy for us and accept our good deeds and gather us with our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu in Jannah. Amen. Life is a journey, beginning with a single step, 
the direction is clear. From the present and past, to you I pray, bow down, prostrate. But it still needs guidance. Worthy of praise, I stand before you with an attentive heart. Erase my sins from the present and past. Hood a GPS. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Inshallah in this segment we'll begin the fifth chapter of Riyadh al-Salihin which is Bab al-Muraqaba or the book of watchfulness and also awareness of Allah's presence, al-muraqaba and supervision. Uh, as usual, al-Imam al-Nawawi put in the beginning of this book a few ayat from the Qur'an uh, which refer to the subject. The first ayah or ayat are of Surah al-Shu'ara, ayah number 218 and number 219. And I would like to add to that the previous ayah which is why Allah mentioned this ayat. So according to the previous ayah, which is 217, and the following ayat of Surah Shu'ara, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى الْعَزِيزِ الرَّحِيمِ الَّذِي يَرَاكَ حِينَ تَقُومِ وَتَقَلُّبَكَ فِي السَّاجِدِينَ وَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى الْعَزِيزِ الرَّحِيمِ And put your trust in the Almighty, the Most Merciful. Who is he? الَّذِي يَرَاكَ حِينَ تَقُومِ The one who sees you when you stand, uh, when you stand up in prayer. And وَتَقَلُّبَكَ فِي السَّاجِدِينَ And also he sees your movement amongst those who prostrate themselves. Well, think about it this way. When somebody is very proud that he has connections, he knows this person or that person is his friend. Why? Because he believes that he's relying on a very powerful person. He has a very strong access. He can do things, right? Okay. In this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordering and Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and accordingly the command is transmitted to all the believers to put their trust and confidence in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he's better than all. He is Al-Aziz. And no one is Al-Aziz but him, the Almighty. He is Al-Rahim. He is more and most merciful with his servants than anybody else with them, than the mother with her own baby. So if this is the case, he is the Almighty, he is able to do all things, and meanwhile he knows your weakness and your need. So this is a beautiful combination. Whenever you turn to him with your dua, with your need, with your mas'ala, then he is the one who would have mercy on you, and he is the one who is able to deliver to you and fulfill your dua and answer your supplication. There are a lot of people who can have mercy on you. Whenever you feel sick, they feel pity for you. Whenever you lose your money, they feel sorry for you. But they are broke too. They cannot assist you. They cannot lift your burden. They cannot take you out of your hardship. So they may have mercy, but they cannot afford to assist you or remove the zulm or the oppression which has been placed on you. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Aziz, Al-Rahim, the Almighty. يُعِزُّ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيُذِلُّ مَنْ يَشَاءُ He gives dignity and mighty to whomever he wills. And he humiliates and disgraces whomever he wills. As the ayah says, تُعِزُّ مَنْ تَشَاءُ وَتُذِلُّ مَنْ تَشَاءُ بِيَدِكَ الْخَيْرِ بِيَدِكَ الْخَيْرِ In your hand is all the good. Indeed, you're able to do all things, okay. Furthermore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
in address the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa was some of the qualities, the traits of Allah the Almighty. And as we know that Al-Quran was Sunnah are the only sources uh, through which we can get to know about the beautiful names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We cannot just invent uh, any attribute on our own because we think so. In the hadith, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, supplicated and invoked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala via the means of his beautiful names. And he said, I invoke you by every name of yours. Which you name yourself with. أو أنزلته في كتابك. Or you sent it down, you revealed it in your book. So that's why we know it. أو علمته أحدا من خلقي. Or you taught that name to any of your teachers, such as the prophets. أو استأثرت به في علم الغيب عندك. Or you withheld and you kept with you in the knowledge of the unseen. So that means Allah's beautiful names are beyond the 99 names are countless, beyond count. Some of these names Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in the Qur'an, taught to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the sunnah, recommended for us to invoke him with, and beyond that, we cannot go any further. So some of these attributes here, he said, Al-Aziz, Al-Rahim, Yaraka hina taqum, the one who sees you when you stand up in prayer. Well, the prayer is not only about standing up, isn't it? Right. It's about standing down, down, and making sujood. But the ayah talked about, يَرَاكَ حِينَ تَقُومُ Then the following one, وَتَقَلُّبَكَ فِي السَّاجِدِينَ Making frequent sujood among those who prostrate themselves. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specify al-qiyam and al-sujood out of the rest of the arkan of the prayer? After this call, inshallah, we'll answer this question. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Asia from the KSA. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alaykum alaykum salam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Sister Asia, how are you? Alhamdulillah, fine. Jazakallah khair for that. Wa jazakum. Sheikh, uh, actually, uh, when uh, there are many people, uh, when uh, there, uh, they, are, they are quoting the hadith, they are saying, the authorities where you are staying, uh, they are giving you the privilege of saying salah and doing your uh, arakan of deen. So you are not uh, supposed to uh, raise a voice or against them, though they may be helping the people, those who are suppressed, uh, but you are not supposed to say against them. And they are quoting some hadith regarding that. And, uh, and the heart becomes so restless when we see they are our brother and sister, the people who are supporting the other people for suppression to them are our brother and sister. And we people are enjoying the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and can't do anything except only dua. Uh, so uh, in certain situation, it happens that the people here, uh, the people everywhere, they forget about the people who are suppressed. Mm. And... Uh, but, and sometimes uh, if we try to raise the voice, they, they ignore us. Nobody try to listen to us. Are we sinful for that? What should we do in certain situations? Taib, barakallahu feek you, sister. Asia, uh, when you say nobody is listening to us, it is not exactly true. No one is listening to us, that is not exactly true. Because when you call on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as the ayah says, وَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى الْعَزِيزِ الرَّحِيمِ الَّذِي يَرَاكَ حِينَ تَقُومُ وَتَقَلُّبَكَ فِي السَّاجِدِينَ He's always listening. When we say upon rising up from ruku' we say, سَمِعَ اللَّهُ لِمَنْ حَمِدَهِ Allah heard the praises of those who praise Him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very near. He, uh, he hears us and he answers our dua. True. As far as all what you said of this sad situation that we've been talking about, the solution to that is that every person should bear their proper responsibilities and fulfill them. Fulfill their duties towards their deen, uh, their brothers and sisters, even abroad. Because the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa did not exempt a single person of this ummah 
from fulfilling the duty of changing the munkar from the duty of enjoining what's right and forbidding what is evil. So there are some who have a say, who can actually say no means no, and they stop the oppression, or they correct the error because they have the authorities. Those are the rulers, those are the governors, the law enforcement uh, personnel. They have this responsibility, and if they do not fulfill it, this is one of the means of khiyanatul amana, treating the trust which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala entrusted them with. Okay, we do criticize that, but what about me? What is my role? My role, if I don't have this authority, is to go to the second level, which is enjoining what's right and forbidding what's evil by the tongue. Whether speaking one on one, or in public, or writing articles, or sending mass messages reminding people with the situation of their Muslim brothers in a particular locality who are in need for dua, raise the awareness of the suffering and the need of Muslims in this particular area. So this is something that every person have access to do now via the social network, the social media, and the Facebook, the Twitter, and other uh, media means, the mass emails, WhatsApp, and others. Uh, and if somebody is really under the microscope and he cannot open his mouth, and that happens to some people, in this case, and Nabi وسلم, did not exempt him or her as well. Rather, he said, The least is to detest the munkar. The least is to object to it by your heart. Not to applaud the evil doing of the evil doers or the oppression of the oppressors. Your heart and sympathy goes for the weak, for the needy ones, for the mazloom, for the oppressed ones. And in your dua, you include them in your dua all the time. Because wallahi, no doubt that the sharpest weapon is a dua. And this is something that no one is going to supervise you if you do it or, go, or put a limit or a quarantine on you not to make dua. You can make dua in your sujood, you can make dua in your ruku'ah, you can make dua at the time breaking your fast, you can make dua while getting up from sleep in order to go to the bathroom or grab a drink. This is one of the times where the dua is guaranteed to be answered. Lately, uh, and after learning about this hadith, every time I get alert or I flip over, I say the dua, La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah, lahu al-mulk wa lahu al-hamd, yuhi wa yumit wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. Then alhamdulillah, wa subhanallah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. Then I make istighfar and I make dua. Make dua for the brothers and sisters in Syria. For you Muslim brothers and sisters who are very lonely now, without any support from the so-called Muslim Ummah in Gaza, the Palestinians. Their only support is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are under siege not only from the Zionists, but from Muslims. From Muslims, from their neighbor Muslims, and from the other rulers who are supporting the siege upon the weak and the oppressed. So I do not exclude the oppressors from my dua, but I rather ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to eliminate them and replace them with better people. This is how everyone can fulfill their duty and no one is exempt. No one is exempt. Now, when I go back to uh, the two qualities which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned about himself, besides Al-Aziz and Al-Rahim, Al-Ladi Yaraka Hina Taqoom, he mentioned the night prayer. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in the hadith, Sharaf al The honor of the believer is to pray at night. Mm, okay. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praised those who pray tahajjud. And it is the greatest prayer after the fard. Why is that? Because it is done with absolute sincerity. No one is seeing you. Everybody is asleep. And only you. 
in the darkness of the night, while everybody is resting in the comfort of their beds, you get up to pray, summer, winter, traveling, resident, you're making this habit. So you're not alone. You're not the only one who's awake. No, he is always awake. لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم And always ever watchful and looking at you. يراك حين تقوم When you're standing and you're saying الحمد لله رب العالمين He replies to you, say My servant praises me. We say الرحمن الرحيم He says my servant glorified me. مالك يوم الدين He says my servant exalted me. إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين and you pause he says my servant this is for my servant and I shall grant my servant whatever مسألة or question he asks for so this is يراك حين تقوم and he also mentioned the other praiseworthy position in the salah it's a rukn which is a sujood why because the Nabi صلى الله عليه وسلم said أقرب ما يكون العبد من ربه وهو ساجد أقرب ما يكون العبد من ربه وهو ساجد. الله سبحانه وتعالى rose above the throne above the heavens. He is above the heavens. سبح اسم ربك الأعلى. He is the most high. But when you place your nose and forehead against the ground, you become the closest to Allah سبحانه وتعالى. That is the closest position. And that is the closest practice which will bring you as close as possible to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, فَأَكْثِرُوا مِنَ الدُّعَاءِ وَأَنْتُمْ سُجُودٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah Al-Zukhruf, in ayah number 80, أَمْ يَحْسَبُونَ أَنَّا لَا نَسْمَعُ سِرَّهُمْ وَنَجْوَاهُمْ بَلَى وَرُسُلُنَا لَدَيْهِمْ يَكْتُبُونَ So if he can see you, and he always watchful over you, even when you're praying in the darkness of the night and no one is paying attention to you. He also says in Surah Al-Zukhruf, with regards to the criminals, the disbelievers, do they think that we cannot hear their secret counsel and their whispers, as well as the disclosed one, وَنَجْوَاهُمْ and their hidden conversation? Bala, certainly we do hear what they say in their secret counsel. Not only that, وَرُسُلُنَا لَدَيْهِمْ يَكْتُبُونَ And our angels who have been sent to them to watch over them are recording what they say and what they do as well in writing. يَكْتُبُونَ In the record of their deeds. Imagine, brothers and sisters, you're putting your trust in Allah, the one whom لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم العزيز الرحيم الذي يراك حين تقوم وتقلبك في الساجدين. By that we come to the end of this edition of Guardians of the Pious. And in شاء الله عز وجل until next time I leave you in the care of Allah. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم. والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. رسول الله حبيب الله رسول الله Allah, Allah, our God is the greatest, the one and only glory to Him. He only humans to be the best and give His best religion to them. Allah, our God is the greatest, the one and only glory to Him. He only humans to be the best. And give his best religion to them So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about him in paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling the best with the cheapest price So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about hell and paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling their best with the cheapest price